They'd been looking around Bradford for weeks for another transit, but they were like gold dust, the ones we wanted. Very hard to find. The garages had plenty of newer models at higher prices, but it was the older ones we were after. Anyway, we heard about one out at least today and went over to have a look. It's just something nice to have a look at it. You like that? Yeah. 2.5, Patrick. 2.5. My mate Patrick Ferdinand and me, Fazal Karim, we were planning to drive a couple of these transit from Bradford all the way across Asia to my hometown in Pakistan. We knew we could sell the vans at a decent profit once we got there. But the fact is the trip would be once in a lifetime adventure going halfway across the world. Just totally different to Yorkshire. This one seemed all right, so we thought we'd better grab it while we could. We'd got hold of another one a couple of months back and we'd taken it to the local mechanics to get it properly sorted out, give it a good service, beef up the suspension, you know, make it a bit stronger. On a 5,000 mile journey, the last thing you want is your van packing up on you in the middle of nowhere. But we knew Kayum had fixed up plenty of transits for this trip before, so we were pretty sure he'd do us a good job and we'd be all right. A lot of our people are taking these vans to Pakistan and uh, what they do is they try and get as cheap as possible and uh, you know some of them come in with very bad condition and we have to weld do a lot of welding new panels you know make sure it's all in good nick before they go from here plus uh, the engine you know if, if it needs any work on the engine we have to really make sure that it doesn't give them any problems on the way Patrick and me were minicab drivers. We've been partners in our taxi company for three or four years. The third person we were taking with us was one of our drivers, Azad. He definitely wanted to go and he seemed reliable, you know, the sort of person who'd help you out if you got into any problem on the way. Even though I didn't know him very well, I thought he'd be okay. Um. Patrick I've always been good friends with. He's a West Indian, I'm a Pakistani. It's rare you'll find a relationship or a friendship like that. But it doesn't bother us. He's always wanted to see Pakistan. So doing this trip just seemed like a big opportunity for him, really. On the route we had planned, we'd go from Bradford down to the Channel and then over to Holland. From there we'd go on via Belgium and Germany to Austria and then all the way through Eastern Europe down to Istanbul. Three or four days across Turkey should take us into Iran, and then we'd loop round the bottom of Afghanistan and finally cross the border into Pakistan. The morning we were due to leave Bradford, Azad seemed to be totally disorganized. He hadn't even got his van sorted out. Yes, you take that, Many of my friends, you know, give uh, something to it them, so relatively, you know. And I take for them, you know, it's, uh, they get uh, too much things, you know, from uh, my friends. I was surprised more than anything else. I mean, his one was his problem, not mine. But it didn't look like a good sign somehow. And I've got uh, some parts, you know, I, I need some more parts, but I just, uh, couldn't get any. It. it is not uh, enough place in my van now, and it's really full up. At my house, Patrick and me had our vans packed ready, and the Imam came round to send us off with a blessing. Basically, it was up to us how the trip turned out. But as a Muslim, I also had faith that Allah would be looking after us while we were away on the journey. Good. Hmm? You're going to be good? Yeah? Yeah. Then it was just time for us all to say goodbye to our families. <laughs> yeah, but I right. don't worry. I'm yeah. happy. No, 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 no. I felt pretty confident about the trip, and it was only a few weeks away I'd be seeing my wife and kids again. You're going to look after your mum, eh? I was still getting a bit emotional about it all. 
ओके अल्लाह ने वाला अल्लाह जाओ बेटी को ठीक है ना अल्लाह बहनियों इफ आई स्टार्टेड क्राइंग वेल एवरीबॉडी एल्स वुड टू अल्लाह ने वाला ओके अल्लाह ने वाला अल्लाह ने वाला अल्लाह ने वाला अल्लाह ने वाला with Azad on motorway outside Bradford the clown had put a load of burnt out seats on his roof rack and he was planning to take them all the way to Pakistan I told him straight if you try and drive a van looking like that across 10 borders you're asking for trouble for everybody but he wouldn't shift them Anyway, by evening we'd got down to Sheerness and the ferry that was going to take us across the channel to Holland. I was a bit pissed off, but it's only the first day, so you want to be positive and look on the bright side, make the best of things. We've done enough hard work, Patrick, and, um, and we should uh, and look forward to it. And we're lost it. Yeah, now, we should be realistic. looking forward to it. We should have a good trip, and Fana. I will give you the trip of Pakistan in a lifetime. Yeah. Patrick and me had a rough night on the board and we drove on the dockside late next morning. Then I just couldn't believe it. Azad had already got himself straight into trouble. Because of the rubbish on his roof rack, he and his lad Ifta, who was travelling with him, were pulled by the Dutch immigration and interrogated for three hours. My passport and they say his date is not right. You know, I showed them two passports and uh, other document, driving license, and uh, they say it's. Uh, What happened was the dickhead showed them two passports and a driving license, and they all had different days and places of birth on them. I showed why you know I, mean, I showed them everything, and this is. He's been living in Europe for 25 years, and he still couldn't see why the officials were suspicious. Yeah, well, they like to you know waste time because they've got all day to do. They could have deported him straight back to Britain, and frankly, the way he'd been carrying on, he bloody deserved it. Now they let you go. Yeah, they let me go. Okay. That's not just in the joke. Why did not you go? Well, we finally got going halfway through the morning, and Patrick was taking things carefully, because the continent was all a new experience for him. He was born in Dominica in the West Indies, and he came over to Britain as a teenager. He'd never been abroad before in his life. I don't think he had much of an idea what to expect either. I wanted to press ahead quickly on the motorways in Western Europe because we had a tight schedule to keep to. We had to get to Pakistan in three weeks to be there for the Eid festival. It's a bit like the Muslim Christmas, and my wife and kids were flying out from Britain, so we could all have a big celebration there for the first time. I had to be there. I couldn't miss it, and I've got a whole load of clothes and gifts for my Pakistani relatives loaded up in back of van. It settled down, and things seems to be going okay through Holland and Belgium, where it's flat as a pancake. But when we crossed into Germany, it was obvious we'd got a problem. It was Azad again, because he'd got all the crap piled on top of his van. It was running into a load of wind resistance. On flat roads, he was all right, but on the hills you come to in Germany, he was short of power. He couldn't keep up with the other two vans, and we were always having to slow down. It was getting ridiculous. I was going to sort him out when we stopped to cook the evening meal that night. 
We brought a lot of curry with us from Bradford, which our wives had made, and all we had to do was heat it up on a gas ring. Because three of us are Muslims, we didn't want to eat the local stuff. And anyway, we preferred our own food. It's what we're used to. When the meal was over, I just told us that straight, the junk on his roof had to go, no argument about it. There's no way Patrick and me were going to be held back and lose valuable time just because of him. When you come on a trip like this, you might expect all sorts of aggravation from everyone else you meet, but not from someone from your own community. I knew then I'd made a mistake. If he'd got properly organized in Bradford, he'd never have needed a roof rack. Now he had to sling everything he'd got in the back and still find space for him and his lad to stretch out. There was no chance they'd get a decent night's sleep in there. It looked like a bomb site. We got the roof rack cleared, and next morning we were making much better progress. We got down to southern Germany, to Bavaria. Before lunch, we got to watch one of the main milestones on a journey like this, crossing the river Danube. house just by the bridge. It's an old university town. It turned off because Patrick and me wanted a bit of a look around some of the places we were passing through. It was part of the reason we'd come, and anyway, we needed to do some shopping. Because I'd like this to Because yeah. I'd like this yeah. We wanted to get some vegetables in for dinner that night to add something fresh. Should have been easy enough. Of course, neither of us could speak any German. So you never know whether you'll need to use sign language or what kind of reaction you'll get. But they were very friendly in the shop. Patrick, I think, liked the atmosphere in Germany, but he just seemed kind of puzzled by it all as well. I suppose they speak English in Dominica, they speak English in Bradford. He'd never been anywhere where they don't speak English. I don't think he'd ever really thought about it. Thank you, Shin. Auf Wiedersehen. Uh, I find it quite funny, you know, the different language of speaking and the different uh, money and currency, which um, I don't understand the right law about the currency. I just sort uh, of go ahead with the currency, what they, um, whatever they tell me to pay, I just pay it. But I like the accent of the people and the way they talk, and the, the road, and the scenery and the buildings, you know, it sets it's sort of quite different to uh, New stuff. And um, I'm just looking ahead to see what it's going to be like further on when I get into Pakistan. By the Austrian border, I was just beginning to get a bit worried about what might happen. I knew I'd got a problem with Azad, but with Patrick, we were getting along fine. But he didn't really seem to have found his feet yet. Patrick, the good pal of mine, but with him being his first time going abroad, and he's never done a journey like this, it's a long journey, he, I'm just starting to wonder if he will be able to um, carry out the responsibility, because you have to eat sensible, drink sensible, drive sensible, and it just makes me wonder if he's capable of that duty. The fourth day we were into Eastern Europe, we got to Budapest in Hungary. It was definitely looking different to the West. A bit run down, lots of little shops and stalls on the street, that sort of thing. But big cities are a nightmare for keeping three ones together if you don't know the road, so we didn't hang about.
Down into southern Hungary, the countryside was getting very boring. Small farms and wide open fields, but we kept going. Now we'd crossed into former communist countries, I was feeling a lot less comfortable. At least in the West, you know, the law is the law, and if you behave yourself, you'll be all right. Further on in Turkey and Iran, we'd be Muslims in a Muslim culture. In Eastern Europe, well, you're never quite sure what to expect. By late afternoon, we'd been going well. We'd made up good time, and then suddenly, I could see it all falling to pieces. As we came to the frontier with Romania, we ran into a 10-mile queue of trucks, all lined up waiting to cross. It was going to be the same old-style hustle you used to get at a border in Eastern Europe, the kind of thing that should have disappeared along with the Russians. It looked like we'd be stuck there for a couple of days at least and totally mess up our schedule. In the end, we only got stuck on the border six hours, thank God. But the first time we drove into in Romania, Azad was half asleep. We got lost and separated. We were up till midnight driving around the streets looking for each other. I was just getting totally fed up with him. Now, like, we've been on the trip for, I think, it's fifth day now. Uh, I'm, be I'm beginning to wonder if this uh, person was suitable to be in our crew. Because every time he is mourning, complaining, you know, I mean, I've never s seen him smile since the day we met. Fair enough, we all uh, miss our families, we miss our homes, but once you are away from home, that doesn't mean that you have to be miserable or put a miserable face and annoy other people. In Romania, you feel like you're in a totally different world to Germany or even Hungary. The truck drivers are complete bloody lunatics, and the roads are terrible too. They're narrow and full of potholes, and you try to swerve round one, and you just go straight into another. With the loaded one in the wet is very dangerous, especially when you're braking. Romania just seemed like a peasant country. You wonder whether money's much good to them, whether they don't just swap everything, barter everything instead. Looks like it must be 40 or 50 years behind Britain. It's going to need a lot of help from somebody to get proper development and a proper economy running. The next day in Bulgaria, there's a wedding going on. We'd stopped outside by the road for a snack. And they just invited us in. It was very kind of them. We became sort of special guests at the party. Maybe it was one of those traditions of strangers bringing good fortune or something. I don't know. Anyway, it was kind of a bit of luck that happens when you're traveling. Something you really enjoy, but you could never plan. What you do get used to, especially in Eastern Europe, is the reaction you get from some people. Sometimes just by the look of them you can tell, you know they're hostile to you, they don't want to know you at all. And sometimes they just want to mess about and take the mickey. I think particularly in Romania and Bulgaria, they're not used to seeing too many black people and Asian people. And a group like us really confused them why as to what we were doing there but you can definitely sense a bit of racist feeling sometimes. The one place you know you'll always get aggravation is at a border. We crossed the next day from Bulgaria into Turkey, and the Bulgarian custom gave us the right going over. They just greedy the whole lot of them. You can't avoid it. We were furious for the simple reason they wanted us to pay them a bribe to for us to exit the country. They didn't pay anything to enter the country. Why pay to exit the country? But How unfortunately, we had to do it. Just messing you about, wasting your time, because they were laughing all the way along. They were after the video it's camera, you know, and uh, nothing they official. They asked me, in my, um, have you got I mean, anyway. sex tape? I say we're Muslim. Yeah, they asked to me as well. Nothing. They're laughing, they're all corrupt. <laughs> they are, they're definitely corrupted, you know. No doubt about that. I mean, when 
after that we left. Yeah. Yes. English money, Dominican money, Deutsche Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, Deutsche Mark and English money. Yeah. Deutsche Mark. Deutsche Mark. Deutsche Mark. <laughs> Deutsche Mark. So you give you it know, to him. And you just I give him 10 Deutsche Marks. Is that? I say receipt? No receipt. Mm -hmm. Go, go, go. <laughs> right. What the hell do you make out of it, you know? Consensus straight away, guys. Um, they give too much energy. God help them. Another couple of hundred miles from the border and we finally made it to Istanbul. We managed the first stage of the journey through Europe okay. The van's been running well and we were more or less on schedule. So it was a big sense of relief just to have reached the halfway mark without any major problems. It gave us a chance to relax a bit. And coming into a Muslim country, there's a definite change of atmosphere anyway. It just made us feel more at home altogether. One thing I'd been planning for the journey since before we left Bradford was to pray in the Blue Mosque. Istanbul's full of beautiful buildings, but the Blue Mosque probably the most famous of them. So because I was there, it was like a big opportunity. Chances are I'll never come again, so I wanted to make the most of it. You can see there are Muslim pilgrims about, but when you get inside, it doesn't really feel like a normal mosque because all the people in there are just tourists chatting and taking photographs and generally making a noise. It's a magnificent looking building, no doubt about that, but praying's meant to be a kind of relaxation, helps put your mind at rest, and basically I felt a bit self-conscious about it. Hazard and Iftar came along, but obviously they didn't want to pray because they didn't have any clean clothes, but Azad's mood did seem to have changed since we got to Turkey. It seemed to have lightened up a bit. And I hope to God that was a good sign. In the last year, you know, Bulgaria and Hungary and uh, Romania, I didn't eat anything. So, and we didn't uh, cook anything, so, you know, there. Because people's bar is uh, very rough, you know. And in this country, this is a uh, Turkish Muslim country, you know. And uh, I eat everything now in here. I'm very happy. Next day we were heading out of Istanbul towards Ankara. We got caught up in rush hour on Ring Road. The traffic was all jammed up. And then I got a nasty surprise. Some dickhead of a Turkish driver tried to push in front of me. He smashed into the van, bent the wing and ripped the bumper off. Fortunately, there was a policeman there, or the Turks would have probably just buggered off and left us. But at the end of the day, if you can't speak the local language, you're not likely to get justice. If you're lucky, you'll just avoid getting completely stuffed. We got a few quid off them eventually. It was just like a token payoff. Ten miles further on, we came to the big suspension bridge, and at long last, we got out of Europe and into Asia. It should have been a nice moment for Azad, but halfway across, he realized he left his passport in Istanbul. But Patrick Ali seemed a lot more relaxed than he had been, particularly in Eastern Europe. I was on the way through Bremenia, uh, called into a restaurant, and the guys in the restaurant, you know, they was amazed to see me, you know, they was all just staring, stood looking at me, like it was something from the different planet. Obviously, they haven't seen a black man or a West Indian come past that area. And um, even the girl that was cooking in the kitchen, they, they must have told her about, you know, this, this man outside, and she came around and picked out and having a good look at me, you know. So I just gave her a little wave, and went and sit down and got on with the meal. I was a lot more bothered about the journey ahead. We'd been messed about by the Iranian embassy in London. They told us to get our visa for Iran in Ankara instead. Easy enough to do in theory, but it was a hassle I could do without. 
In Ankara, the traffic was diabolical, and just as I'd been afraid of, Patrick let me down. Him and Azad got lost. I couldn't believe this had happened again, but I wasn't going to waste any more time. I just went straight down to the Iranian embassy for the visas. But might as well have not bothered. Even though I got a recommendation from the British embassy, they treated me like dirt. And by the time I finally met up with the other two next day, there didn't seem any point hanging around in Ankara. If that was how the Iranians were going to behave, we'd do better driving on to Erzurum. Yeah. What we're trying to do is, if we can get the letters of recommendation from British yeah. and ask if the Iranians are messing about, yeah. what we could do is go to Erzurum, there's a consulate there, so we get the visas done yeah. there, so we can drive today and tomorrow and we'll get there Saturday, so it'll save our wasting of time, you see, if we're going to lay about. They're close field. tomorrow, aren't they? They're close tomorrow, but yeah. we can be driving, it's about 600 miles to Erzurum, that's near the border. Yeah. And we, if we can get the visas from there, possibly it help, you see. One thing I knew about Turkey was, the roads in the east of the country were terrible. So I definitely wanted to get the accident damage to the one looked at before we left Ankara. The chassis was sound. It turned out it was just the body that needed fixing. I was actually quite impressed with the mechanic. He managed to reshape the wing without damaging the paintwork anymore. That's tricky. If they know you're a foreigner, they'll never see you again, so there's no comeback. You're always kind of half expecting to be stitched up. But this lot did a very good job on the van and they treated us well, so it was nice. But once we were out of the city and back on the road, the more I thought about the Iranians, the more angry I got. To be honest with you, they haven't done us any favours with us being Pakistani Muslims and being fellow Muslims. This, they are supposed to help us. We went for the visas. There was no official that could speak to us or anything, just the person at the door. He took the application form in, come back with a piece of uh, ripped newspaper, have the day down, come back in 10 days. We can't wait 10 days. We need to get back to Pakistan to join up my family for the Eid festival. If we are to wait 10 days, there's still no guarantee we're going to get the visas end of day. So, uh, you know, I just think they're lazy dossers. They have no respect or feeling for anybody else, just for themselves. Two hundred miles further east, we stopped by the road again for the night. No bandits about that we could see, but you can never be too careful. Good cheers, you there. Getting into the mountains the next day, I'd been expecting the road to be bad, but the weather was shocking. I brought my swimming trunks with me from Bradford because I thought maybe we could stop off now and again and have a swim in the rivers. But there was snow on the ground everywhere, and the clouds were so low in some places, you could hardly see 20 yards ahead. And all these trucks crawling along made it very slow going. It was two really hard days driving before we finally got down out of the mountains and made it to Erzurum. close to the Iranian border now, and you could definitely tell by the look of the place and the people, it was much more like Central Asia here, and much more like Pakistan. So for the first time really on the whole trip, I felt like we kind of blended in a bit. We weren't obviously outsiders, perhaps not Patrick, but certainly the rest of us. We were feeling a lot better generally, and the day after, we headed straight off the Iranian consulate to get the visa sorted out. 
we didn't want to get delayed any longer than we had to. I was pretty confident that the council here would see us right. Quite a few of my friends had driven to Pakistan this way before, and they'd got their visas in Erzurum without any trouble. But I couldn't have been more wrong. If the Iranian officials in Ankara had been bad, this lot were even worse. They've totally refused us for no reason at all. They've stitched us up, you know. Which, uh, you know, he says, oh, give us the Pakistani let embassy's letters, recommendation letters, this and that. And then still there's no guarantee. Particularly with Patrick, he said, um, no way, you know, if it's a British or Pakistani recommendation, no way, we don't want to know. They totally, you know, I don't know the words, but they have buggered us up for our journey. When he told you to bring the, um, letter, the embassy letters, you know, and he said to him, we'll get visa. He says, I don't know. I look. He says, well, we, letter for you, you. He says, like me, him, no chance. We were completely stuffed. They've destroyed our whole trip in a couple of minutes and they couldn't give a damn. There is no other road from Turkey to Pakistan. So we were in a total dead end in Erzurum. We were stuck with the vans. We couldn't sell them. It was a nightmare. I wish I'd never even started on the journey. We're in the middle of nowhere, nowhere to go. Whatever we did, wherever we went, we'd be wasting time and losing money. And I was sure we'd miss getting to Pakistan for the Eid festival. It was one of the worst days of my life, no doubt about it. There was only one thing that might possibly help us. Hello, is that the British Embassy? Yes, could I speak to uh, Kevin Mowbray, please? The British consul in Ankara knew who we were and he'd given us some help already. He had one suggestion which just might get us out of trouble. You know, they refused, totally refused us, so we can't go back and we can't, you know, go... He said we could try shipping the vans from Turkey to Pakistan by sea. He couldn't guarantee anything, but it just seemed like we didn't have any option except to try it. I just don't have a faith in going for it. And I don't it's not worth it anymore, you know. It's not worth it. It didn't, no. Wasted enough time. Wasting time, you know. What do you think? The shipping would be all right, sir? I think it's good. It's going to cost us to We can't do anything, you know. Well, we need to get out of this yeah. place, innit? We have to get home one way or the other. Yes. We can't go back. And t to be honest with you, I'm sick of it. I can't take it anymore. We've been on the road 15 days, 14, right? 15 days. No. And I think I'll it's rather not, ship not the one. It's not worth it. You know, so that's you right. You know. from a corner to Pearl, you know, you, you don't know where you go. You go I think it's not worth it. Even a second, you know, waiting in uh, Turkey, you know. Well, we had a good night's sleep and then we just got back on the road next day and headed off for Mersin on the south coast. There was no point hanging about in Erzurum. Anything that could possibly get us out of trouble had to be worth a try. But it was still a complete gamble. I'd got eight O-levels at school in Bradford, but how was I supposed to know anything about shipping in Turkey? I'd never been to Mersin. I've no idea what sort of arrangements you had to make or whether we could afford it or anything. It was a two-day journey without any kind of guarantee at the end of it. And our families didn't know where we were or when they'd see us. So heading for the course is just basically like a leap in the dark. Two and a half weeks sleeping in the back of a van. You get pretty fed up with it. But at least if you're comfortable at night, you can handle all the driving well enough next day. I was all right, but most days as hard than if I looked totally knackered. The second morning after we turned back from Erzinum, we cleared the mountains for good and finally turned south towards the coast. But we were all still really bitter out how the Iranians had messed us up. Yeah, I think it's racist as the guy myself. It spoiled my journey, which I wanted to do the journey all the way. You know? So I told Fazil, we might as well just ship the vehicles the rest of the way, and let's make the rest of the journey by air, and we pick the vehicle up at the other end. Because I am just totally pissed off with the Iranians.
couple hours later, we were just driving through this little village, minding our own business, and we saw there was some kind of festival going on. We stopped and had a look, and the Turks were very friendly. It turned out it was a kind of national holiday and there's a big parade and sports and all that kind of thing. These days you'd never get all the kids in England to dress up and march around like this. It just seemed like the Turks have more pride in their culture than we have now in Britain. The dirt road was full of roads and it was knocking hell out of the one suspension and you could feel it in your backbone all the time. But eventually it changed back to tarmac again and at the end of the afternoon we arrived at the south coast. What hits you straight away in Mersin is how hot and humid it is. It's a completely different world to Erzurum or Ankara. We'd come here because it's Turkey's biggest port, so if there was any chance at all, we'd be more likely to find a ship to take the ones to Pakistan here than anywhere else. But we hadn't a clue where to start or what to do. The bloke at the embassy in Ankara told us the British had a consul in Mersin who looked after things for them, so the best thing we could do was go and see him and see if he could do anything to help us. Couldn't believe our luck. It turned out he was a consul only part-time. His real business was a shipping agent, so he knew all about everything. The power of attorney should include your name, your wife's name, and his name, because one of the vehicles is... What we had to do was sign over power of attorney on the ones to Andre, so they could clear custom and be exported when a ship for Karachi came in. Might be several weeks we'd have to leave the ones at the docks, while we went on by plane to Pakistan. Yes. Any ordinary Turk, no way would I trust him. But with a British official, well, you knew you should be all right. It seemed we just might be able to salvage our situation. If we could get all the paperwork sorted out with Andre in two or three days, we should be able to fly to Pakistan for Eid. So what we needed to do was take everything valuable we could with us and then hide the rest of the stuff as best as we could. Otherwise, thieves might nick it out the docks. Of course, it all turned out too good to be true. Next day, we heard what the shipping was going to cost. Four times what we'd been expecting. We'd already been shelling out right and left for lawyers and translators and God knows what. Now we're just going to be cleaned up completely. But we didn't have any other choice. We were snookered. There was nothing else we could do but pay. It was costing us a bloody fortune. But at the end of the day, the British Embassy had saved our skin. And at least us and the ones were going to get home to Pakistan. Well, that was the way it should happen. Because as we drove the vans down to leave them at the docks on the last day, to be honest, I was wondering whether we'd ever see them again or what sort of state they'd be in if they ever did get to Karachi. We'd been knocked about so much, I was just losing faith in everything. We did finally get out of the docks and onto the bus station, but not before the Turkish customs took another hundred dollars off us in bribes. You know, it's like the law of the jungle in a place like that. If you don't pay up, you just won't survive. At least with the British officials, they deal with you straight. You know where you are. But once you're dealing with the Turks, well, it's another thing entirely. Yeah. We're just totally pissed off and we're exhausted. We're, we've run out of money because we didn't expect certain big problems like this to occur. And uh, we're waiting for the bus to Istanbul. Once we get to Istanbul, then we can uh, fly from there to Karachi and Islamabad back to our Pakistan. And that will be a relief. One thing what we want to do is get back to our country. It was 16 hours in the bus and another 24 hours hanging about in Istanbul. But eventually we got onto a plane at the airport 
and we were right glad to get out of Turkey at last. Pakistan hits you in the face a bit when you arrive. I love the place and I'm proud to be a Pakistani. But when you've been living in the West almost all your life like I have, the noise and the heat and the general disorder takes some getting used to again. All the time we'd been stuck in Turkey, my family hadn't known where we were or when we'd be coming to Pakistan. So I think they were just as glad to see us as I was to see all of them. I wouldn't say my worries disappeared completely when we arrived in Mirpur, but I was feeling a lot better. I am very relieved uh, for the simple reason that I have made it home and uh, have met up with my family, uh, wife and children. It was a long time uh, I haven't seen them, but will the ones ever get to Karachi? Will the goods in the ones ever get to Karachi? After that, once they have got there, will I get stitched up by the customs? You know, what, they're going to charge extortionate rates or what, you know? And, and it's all the aggravation I've had so far, and there's still a little bit left to go through before I am fully relieved that I will ever uh, be able to re rest in peace. <coughs> I think Patrick was knocked back a bit by Pakistan. He thought it'd be much more like Britain than it is, but with much better weather. Well, he was right about that. It was the hottest month of the year, way over 100 degrees every day. So we got him kitted out in a pair of local pyjamas to keep him cool. Tie that sort of thing, tie that to your waist, right? There. Don't have to put too many knots in that. When you want to go to the toilet, you can't find it and too late, you see. Yeah. Unless you wear the right clothes in this country, you're really going to suffer. Well, for him, I think it was just like a fancy dress party. All right, GD. That's my concern, GD, now. Keep that down. I'm going to attract attention. How do you feel? Oh, this is cool. It's better than having a sticky T-shirt to you. Better, you know, it's cool, so Yeah. All right, let's go. All right. One thing about a village in Pakistan is that all your neighbours know everything that's going on. So the word got out really quick that we'd arrived from Britain. The next day the local musicians turned up and they played a few tunes as a kind of welcoming ceremony for us. It was very nice. My first duty when I got home was to go and visit my uncle. He'd had a family tragedy a couple of years back when there was a big flood in the area. And I hadn't seen him since then to offer condolences or anything. My uncle's been trying to explain to me exactly what happened when the flood came to Pakistan. Uh, he lost all his land, he lost all his animals, and the sad fact is he lost four of his children. And you can't replace the children, you can replace everything else. His house was just about there where the three trees are. And that is the reason I brought one of the vans to uh, assist him, that he could start a new business and uh, get back on his feet and uh, lead a normal life again. Transit vans are definitely a good business in Pakistan. There's tens of thousands of them driving around, carrying passengers from one place to another. They're like the local bus service all over the country. And originally, all these vans were bought in Britain and then fixed up and driven overland out here by people just like me and Patrick and Azad. Basically, they're all British under the skin. You can import them at cheap tax rate and then sell them on. 
or else you can get one of your own relatives to start work with them. If our transits were ever going to arrive from Turkey, that's what we'd been planning. But because we hadn't got the vans with us, we had to use a local transit to get about. Patrick was keen to see a bit more of Pakistan, and he wanted to go on to Gujakan to visit an old mate of his. He'd been in the minicab business with him in England a few years back. A lot of the roads in Pakistan are much better than they are in Romania, and they're full of the same bloody kamikaze drivers too. And it felt a bit strange to be sitting in the passenger seat, when for the last three weeks, we'd got used to spending all day behind the wheel. It's not exactly what I'd planned to be doing when I was in England. One thing about ones in Pakistan, they'd never be on repair. As long as it's still got four wheels, it'll be back on road sooner or later. This is it, I think. Is it? Yeah, I'm sure. Well, this is my face. Patrick's mate Fiaz is some kind of local landowner. But he told us to come to his house in town first of all. He'd got a Pakistani wife out on his farm, but in Gujar Khan he was staying with his English wife, Diane. And I think she was glad to see some friendly faces from back home. Anyway, Patrick had plenty to say for himself, especially about what happened in Romania. Yes, a few minutes later, just in three couples coming, banging, boom, 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 they start checking me from the check the window, and I've sat there, you know, just watching in the mirror, and they try to close the window on that, you know. And when they got near to me, and they saw me, they just jumped, and then they said to me, window, lock, back door, lock, you sleep, I'm here, no problem. Go. <laughs> well, oh, great, I can sleep now, you know. Middle at night, there's still was banging on this coach, you know, for parking tax, parking tax. Did you go on parking tax? Yeah? Did you go on parking tax? <laughs> <laughs> I would have done that, I'm crapping myself. <laughs> okay. Azad's village is out in the country near Gujakan, and I wanted to go and have a word with him while I could. We'd all have to go down to Karachi together in a few weeks to collect vans from docks. But knowing Azad, he'd get up to all sorts of nonsense when I wasn't around. So I wanted to make quite sure he was under control. I think, yeah, after a few All right. See you later. Back in Mirpur, the whole family was busy getting everything ready for the Eid festival. New clothes is one thing you can make them for the kids yourself or you can go along to the tailors and get it done and then you've got to get a load of extra food in for the big meal it's a kind of religious occasion all your relatives come round to your house and you sit down and eat together and you'll have a sacrificial animal and that's been specially slaughtered i used to be a butcher in bradford before i got into the taxi business so looking after it that was my job basically it boils down to a lot of extra work for the women in the family Everyone enjoys it. It's one of those once-a-year occasions you're all looking forward to. Where we live in Chechia, there's a shrine right next to the house. It's a saint's tomb, and a lot of pilgrims come to it from all over. And because I'm a Sunni Muslim, I believe in the saints and the prophets and I like to go in and pray there too. On a journey like we'd done, despite all the hassles, we had eventually arrived in Pakistan in one piece. And in my heart, I was thinking the saint probably had some involvement in it. So I like to pay my respects and show some thanks. This was the first time I'd ever celebrate Eid in Pakistan with all my family. And it was the first time my children had ever been to Pakistan. So it was very important for me. Back home in Bradford, we're obviously part of the British society, but you do want to keep hold of your roots at the same time. And Pakistani culture is still my pride, even when I'm 5,000 miles away.
journey, it was basically aggravation all the way. But I did feel it was worthwhile. We all got back in time for Eid one way or other. So it felt like an achievement in the end. But once is enough, next time is to plane all the way, definitely. Thank you.